Hello. This video is a continuation of the previous one on oil field material balance. So we derive the equation um, in the last lecture, and I said every detail of that equation isn't terribly important, and I'm not going to write it out in its full form again. What I'm going to do in this video is show how we actually use it to determine the amount of oil and gas that's underground, the strength of the aquifer, and then to give some idea of production mechanisms and guidance into how the field will be produced in the future. So what we do here is I'll go to the whiteboard. And um, what I will do is I will write out the material balance equation to begin with, and then we'll show um, how we can deal with it. So F is the reservoir volume of the fluids we produce. And um, I'm not going to write out the, the, the terms there, that the, those are in our, my lecture notes, <clears throat> and they're also um, available in the, in the previous video. So F is N times E naught, where E naught is the expansion, the relative expansion of oil plus the solution gas. And um, then we have a term Nm, M is the relative size of the gas cap. And we have the expansion of gas plus WC delta P. If we're using our pot aquifer model, if not, we can use a more general aquifer model here, but the terms there are related to the strength of the aquifer. And then the final term is N1 plus M because it involves both the oil column and the gas cap. And then I write the final term here, um, ER. And ER, R for rock, it refers to the expansion of the initial water that's in place plus the compression of the rock. So those are, those, um, is the general, in general, the material balance equation. And there are potentially at least three unknowns. There's N, there's M, and there's the strength of the aquifer. You may also be uncertain on the rock compressibility. So there is a, when you expand out ER, those are the compressibility terms. If you don't, haven't measured those, those values, that is if you don't have a good estimate of what they are, um, in poten potentially that's an unknown. So how do you deal with this? What you could do in general, is just as we did with gas field material balance, you have a table, right, which has all the data. So in all cases, we're going to have something like this. This is the pressure. We have the amount of gas, uh, sorry, oil produced, the cumulative amount of oil produced, the cumulative amount of gas. We may even be producing water. And then we also want to know the uh, properties, BO, BG, and uh, RS, for instance, okay? so. We can imagine that we have a field, a mature field that's been producing oil and gas, okay? We have the initial value on discovery, nothing's been produced, okay? This is BOI, this is BGI, this will be RSI, okay? And then as production proceeds, every six months or so, you will have data, so you have a table of data. And you may have also have some measured uh, properties such as the compressibility of the rock, the compressibility of water, and so on. So in principle, you can put in all this data, and you can simply find the values of N, M, and the strength of the aquifer that match the data, right? It's an optimization uh, procedure. And there is software um, that is available to do that. So, you know, in many ways, well, that's the end of, uh, end of that subject. What else is there to say? Okay, um, fair enough. What we're going to do, however, in uh, this video is just go through simplifications where you can more or less by hand, by plotting a graph, actually find two of the unknowns when you know that one of the unknown can be ignored. Okay. The, other, the other thing that is, is rather useful from this analysis is if we divide through each of these terms by F, and imagine we've done this analysis, so we actually know all of these values. So we actually found the values from the match to the data. And obviously this isn't um, F anymore, this is one. So on the right, on the left-hand side is 100%. Basically that means that's the stuff I produce. And it's produced by four physical mechanisms. 
the oil, right, the uh, oil and solution gas, by the gas cap, by the aquifer, and by the rock. So you can take, for instance, your last set of data, and you can calculate the value of each of those terms. So imagine this one is 50, uh, 0 0.5, 50%. Okay. Imagine this is 0 0.3, this is 0 0.1, and this is 0.1. So what you say is 50% of the recovery comes from the expansion of oil and solution gas, 30% will come from the expansion of a gas cap, 10% from the aquifer, and 10% from the rock compressibility from which you might conclude, actually, that the aquifer and the rock aren't that strong. Okay, so the, 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 the movement, the natural movement of water from the aquifer isn't strong. Um, there is a gas cap, so that, that, that's positive, but uh, it's not producing, you know, it's only 30%. And the remainder is actually coming just from the expansion. And so, um, you know, when you're thinking then about how I'm going to operate this field, uh, one thing would be, well, maybe to boost the gas cap expansion by injecting more gas into the gas cap. Okay, there's an example. If we have a very strong aquifer drive, you might say, well, I don't need to do anything because the water is pushing out the oil naturally. You may want to boost the aquifer drive by injecting water either into the aquifer, um, but it may not be well connected with the oil column, or, or you might be injecting water into the base of the oil column. So it gives you ideas. It doesn't tell you exactly what to do, but it gives you an understanding. Any reservoir engineer should know, I have this field, I have done material balance, the production mechanisms are. And they're not on off, they're not, it's a solution gas drive, no, it's a gas cap drive, no, it's a this or a that. Not categorization, it's quantification. You can quantify each of those terms. Okay, so let's, um, let's just go through some of the cases that we could consider. So let's um, get rid of the table because we'll assume we've got this table. Now I'm going to take the first case, a simple case, right? which is, imagine that the initial pressure is significantly greater than the bubble point pressure. What that means is that there isn't a gas cap. Just remember, we're all why? The reason why is as follows. If we're well above the bubble point, okay, the oil is well above the bubble point. That means I need to drop the pressure before gas comes out of solution, before it's in equilibrium with gas. But if there's a gas cap, it is in equilibrium with gas. So one of the things from the, the, the phase behavior calculation is that if you have an oil field with a gas cap present, actually at the gas oil contact, the pressure in the oil is the bubble point. If it was higher than the bubble point pressure, well then it would dissolve the gas, and that's not in equilibrium. If it were lower than the bubble point pressure, will it be exolving gas and the gas over geological time going to the gas cap? So the only place where it could be is at equilibrium is at the bubble. So we know immediately, right? So this is a bit of, you know, using some common sense. If we're well above the bubble point. Okay, fair enough. So let's take an example. And we're gonna start with an example that isn't traditional material balance at all. It's, I've discovered an oil field. And one of the key, problems people don't know is they don't know on discovery the strength of the aquifer. And so there's often quite a lot of wishful thinking, you know, there's going to be a strong aquifer, so we don't need to inject anything, we're going to be all right, you know, we can get out that oil cheaply. Um, on the other hand, the aquifer may not be that strong, it's not because there's no water in contact with the field, but because that water isn't well connected, in fact, there are low permeability barriers to flow. So let's take a worst case scenario. What would happen if WC was zero? So this is if, right? It's an if statement, not a, an assumption. So you say, well, okay, I uh, can't use material balance because <clears throat> material balance relies on the analysis of production data. What I'm gonna show is that even just using material balance to understand um, can be useful even in the early stages. So imagine um, there isn't an aquifer. So if we um, look at this and we're above the bubble point, E naught right, is just BO um, minus BOI. 
that's all it is because the um, solution gas term disappears because RS is RSI. There's no contribution from the solution gas. And then the other thing we want to look at is uh, compressibility because this above the bubble point is just related to the compressibility. So the compressibility of oil is one over V dV dP. Okay? If we look at this, this is the reservoir volume of oil divided by the surface volume. So if we look at BO minus BOI over BOI, this is just equivalent to a change in reservoir volume, because it's reservoir divided by surface. Here it's reservoir divided by surface. So the surface volumes cancel out. It's a change in the volume of oil divided by the initial volume. So this can be written as delta VO P. So this can be written simply as CO delta P. And I've been cunning with my um, signs here. This is positive, CO is positive. This is a pressure drop. So where the minus sign has disappeared is dp is actually negative delta p is positive so i've subsumed the minus signs and again don't go around in circles agonizing about it you know compressibility is positive you know oil is going to expand above the bubble point don't let your physical intuition drive the maths not just stuff in minus signs and get yourself into a mess over it. okay so this is correct um as written so the um where you can write eo is in fact uh boi CO. So it's, um, it looks like that. So what I want to do now is I'm going to raise a few things because I also want to um, look at this rock term as well. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this because we've already written that down. And I want to write in the rock term. And then I want to look at the values in various terms. Okay. So we do have the rock and um, solution. Uh, the rock and uh, initial water present. So ER is BOI CW plus SWI CW over one minus I delta P. Okay, maybe make that a little bit neater there. There's a minus sign there. Okay. So now if we look at this, um, M is zero. So the way in which we can write the material balance equation in this case is F equals N BOI, okay, that's in all of the terms, and there's also a delta P. And then there is some term multiplying delta P. And F, by the way, is MP. Okay, so it's the amount of oil I produce times BO, there is the solution gas, but all the solution gas has dissolved. There's no free gas, and I'm assuming they're not producing any water. Okay. So CF is the effective compressibility, and that's C oil, because we've got it there, plus this, this other bunch of terms. And uh, that isn't a minus, that's a plus. What am I talking about? The, the two terms add, we made a, we were right, and this is, I'm not doing this very well, is it? Right, so I apologize for that. That's the rock compressibility, the water compressibility, and sorry, they are add additions. So I apologize for writing that down quickly. This is the correct form that we derived in the previous video. So the, this is an effective compressibility. It's essentially the compressibility of the oil, compressibility of the rock, compressibility of the water, and okay, there's some terms here just to get the normalization correct, okay? And then F, is MPBO is this. So we can actually write um, NP over N, which is your recovery factor, is BOI over BO, and that's close to one, okay? Um, CF. Yep, the P, okay? So the um, pressure the, the amount you produce, the recovery factor, is basically proportional to the pressure drop because you have these linearly compressible fluids. You've got oil, you've got water, you've got the rock, you drop the pressure, right? The rock crushes down, the water, the oil expand, and the amount of recovery is just proportional to the pressure drop. Um, and there's some effective compressibility in between. 
So let's um, erase some of the stuff we don't need anymore. Okay, I can get rid of this. Right, this um, wasn't right in the first place. Okay, CF I'm going to keep. And this equation I'm going to use. So let's now put some numbers here. Okay, what's the compressibility of oil? Compressibility of oil, it's not as compressible as, um, uh, sorry, it's, it's more compressible than water. Water is pretty incompressible. Oil is more compressible. Typical values here about 10 to the minus nine Pascal. Water, as I said, is about four times 10 to the minus 10 for Pascal. And also a typical rock compressibility, if it's reasonably um, consolidated, say is 10 to the minus nine. And the oil may be larger than that. Let's, let's put in, say, three times 10 to minus, just, to, just for, for an example. And it does depend. Funny enough, uh, fluid near the critical point is infinitely compressible. So if it's a black oil a long way from the critical point, it tends to be relatively incompressible. As you go closer to the critical point, you get more volatile oils, gas condensates, you're going to get a larger compressor. Okay. So my CF, I need to know what my water saturation is. So imagine my water saturation is, say, 0.2. So CF is going to be 3 times 10 to the minus 9 plus 10 to the minus 9 plus 8 times 10 to the minus 11 over 0 0.8. Okay, and that's roughly, that's going to be 1.25. It's roughly about 4 times 10 to the minus 9, right? This is the contribution of the water as you can see, is two orders of magnitude slower, lower, or one order of magnitude. So it's roughly four times the minus nine, and that's precise. Right? Obviously, you can do it more precisely. Okay, that, that that's fine. So now, um, again, I said, well, yeah, okay, fair enough. But where are we where are we heading with all of this? Um, you know, big deal. Okay, so. So let's just give you know an example, right? And obviously every case is different, but this is you know a way of thinking about it in a simple way, you know, without getting yourself into a mess. So imagine your initial pressure is say twenty megapascals, right? And your bubble point pressure is ten megapascals. Right? Okay, these are not terribly high pressures, but that pressure difference is typical. So you may have ten megapascals, hundred atmospheres between your initial pressure and the bubble point pressure. That's a big difference, okay? So that difference, the pressure drop before you reach the bubble point is going to be of the order of 10 megapascals to 10 to the seven. You can calculate your recovery factor when you reach the bubble point. If we assume that BOI approximately equal to BO, right, this, this factor is of order one. This is four times 10 to the minus nine. Okay, so what you calculate is you've discovered your field, you're well above the bubble point, that looks great. Okay, you drill a well, the oil comes out, this is all looking good. Um, you know, you know, you can measure the properties of the fluids, you know the compressibility of the oil, uh, the water and the rock. Okay, and you can drop the pressure by 10 megapascals, so half the pressure is gone, and your recovery is 4%. Okay, now, there's something to bear in mind there. Um, so normally people say, I can't use material balance because I don't have any time dependence. But if you're developing a field okay, as a Western oil company, independent oil company, you normally um, have a license for, say, 20 or 25 years. Okay, so you, you bid for a license to explore for oil, you found oil, you then have to have a plan to develop the field, and you're given 20 or 25 years. And over that 20 or 25 years, you probably want to produce about half the oil. Half the oil. Okay, um, and the reason is because, you know, your recovery factor is never going to be greater than about 50%, and we discussed that previously, but let's just a break. So over 20 years, that's about 2.5% a year, but of course, what you want to do is you want to produce a lot to begin with, because it's easier, you have higher pressures, okay, um, so you have a high flow rate to begin with, and then the flow rate drops off, and in one of the subsequent videos, we're going to talk about that. Okay, so uh, that's your idea. So probably in the first year, in year one, typically you want to produce about 5%. Now, 
That isn't just made up, you know, where does that number come from? Outside the context of this course, you would also plan to drill wells, your facilities, you'd separate out the oil and gas, what would you do with the oil, right? There's a whole plan there. But the plan comes with a, I'm an engineer, I design it, it's not numbers that I have to sort of pluck from thin air, I have designed a production facility that I want to produce this much oil, okay? And if you know N, you have an estimate of N, say geologically, you would say, okay, this means in terms of recovery, say 5% in the first year. So what that means is um, you can start producing um, oil for 10 months, less than 10 months, so between nine and 10 months, and uh, you've lost half the pressure in the field, um, and you're gonna go below the bubble point. So within a year, you're below the bubble point, you're producing a lot of gas, um, I'm going to show what happens next, um, but you're condemned to a recovery factor that's probably 15, 20% at most, which is pretty catastrophic. So you need to plan to be able to drill a well into which you're going to inject water within a year. And that's one, one thing that often trips up oil companies is they know they have this accumulation, they know it's close to a big body of water, they're just assuming that there must be an aquifer, and so they say, okay, we'll start producing. We've got a few years to sort of think about it, look at what the oil price is, you know, discuss with the board whether or not we want to make this investment. And you end up, you've got nine months. And so it's a bit of a scrabble because you either have to close in the, the field, which means you're losing money um, and everyone's unhappy, or actually you're dropping below the bubble point and you're hoping uh, you get moved on to another company before you um, uh, realize that you um, actually lost your company billions in revenue. Um, by doing so. Okay, so that's the story there. I mean, it doesn't really use material balance in a classic fashion, um, but it is a um, relatively straightforward um, way of looking at this. Okay, so that's, that would be the first thing I was going to say. But imagine you do drop below the bubble point, and, um, you know, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, that was common, you just did primary production, particularly on, on small fields. So you do drop below the bubble point. What's going to happen in your material balance? Okay, so at this point, when you go below the bubble point, you start producing solution gas. Gas expands in a non-linear fashion, and of course there's a non-linear X solution. So you can't use something simple like this, not all proportional pressure drop. But we do, we do have the equations. So what we do here is, I'm gonna get rid of all the rest of the stuff. So we're gonna talk about the below the bubble point. Okay. So when we're below the bubble point, we have a solution gas, and so it's called a solution gas dry. So we can um, put that in. So this is what's called, okay, solution gas dry. Now, if we looked at this, even above the bubble point, the expansion of oil actually was larger than this rock term. When we go below the bubble point, we've got gas. Gas is much more, you know, 50 times more compressible than rock. So although, you know, if you've got the data, you can include the rock um, expansion, just for simplicity, I'm going to ignore it because it's going to be a small term compared to the expansion of gas. Okay, and again, that's an area that traditionally petroleum engineers sort of agonize over. They want to sort of stuff in lots of terms because it's more terms is always more accurate, but sometimes you just get confused. So we're just gonna, we're going to assume that this term is small. Um, the aquifer, let's assume that the aquifer isn't doing anything, and of course, n equals zero. So in this case, we get a very simple equation, which is n e naught. Okay. So if you were to plot your data, which of course you can, you would plot f over e naught. And I'm not going to go through, yes, there's a table of data, yes, you do it. And your points, okay, it should all lie. I think I can do my nice line. Okay, your points should all lie with a nice straight line. Okay, like that. And your slope right, is n. Okay, so that's, um, that's easy to analyze. Now, the problem with a solution gas drive, as I said, you drop below the bubble point, okay, and you start getting bubbles of gas forming in the, in the pore space of the rock. But there comes a point at which that gas um, connects. And you normally have what's called an SGC, a critical gas saturation. Now, something that you measure in the lab, it's quite difficult to measure in the lab because you take 
um, a piece of rock, what's called a core sample, uh, saturated with oil, and you drop the pressure and you see when you can first get flow of gas. Okay? And it's called the great critical gas saturation. But this has to be measured. This is measured in the lab. There's no, there's no magic to these facts. Okay. So there's a critical gas saturation, and, and at that point, um, basically the gas is connected and can flow, and it's sort of game over. You're producing it essentially as a gas field, which is, which is fine if that's what you want to do, but you are leaving behind the more valuable liquid fraction, and you will drop the pressure. I mean, in my example, you've gone from 20 to 10 megapascals, you produce 4% of the oil. You're going to go below that, you're very soon going to have a reservoir that's at such low pressure you can't really produce. There's no driving force for production. And what's more, it's, it's mainly producing um, um, just the gas. Okay, so that's, that's not a good, let's, let's be honest, that's not a good combination. Okay, so um, let's, let's talk about what would happen. And this um, is now a calculation that we did for a gas field, but I want to do it in a more general way. So if you don't mind, um, I'm going to get rid of this. And I'm going to do a general calculation this actually turns out to be very powerful because I don't have to sort of wrestle too much with, with this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my cartoon as usual. Okay. Now imagine we just got oil here and we have some initial saturation and we have some initial pressure. Okay, then we drill our well. And we produce it. Now, in general, what's going to happen is basically two things. Is, as I drop the pressure, the fluids tend to expand. Okay, so BO, which is the ratio of reservoir to surface volumes, changes. Okay, so that's, that's number one. You see this with a gas field, right? You, you produce gas, the gas expands. The oil might expand and then shrink, but it's doing whatever it's doing. So there's a ratio of volumes. The second thing that happens is either naturally or because of injection, the saturation of oil will change, right? Because the oil is being replaced by gas, it's being replaced by water, it's being replaced by what you're injecting, okay? Um, in this particular example, it's because we drop below the bubble point and bubbles of gas come out in the, in the oil column. And of course, where there's gas, it's pushed out the oil. So it actually, you know, does add to production. It's not 100% not, um, disastrous, it's just long term, not very good. Okay, or we could do a water flood or whatever, right? We have some saturation left. So there is actually an easy relationship, which is just like we did for the gas field, that relates um, uh, the two together, and then we will we'll apply it um, specifically um, to, to, to this example. So here, we know that N, okay, is B phi net to gross, S O phi over B O I. Here, it's exactly the same. If I take all this oil to the surface, okay, then it's what I had originally minus what I produced because that's what's underground. Its surface volume is V by net to gross. So over beer. Okay. Well, I eliminate all these terms. So N minus MP is equal to N V phi net to gross is N BOI over SO. And my recovery factor is MP over M. So what I can do is I find here my recovery factor from here. It's very simple. I divide through by N, so that's one. That's my recovery factor, and that's one. Okay, then I put that over there, and then one minus this. So it's one minus. Okay, so this is quite a general equation. Okay, it's quite a general equation, um, and they're two terms. So the recovery factor, and it's a general equation that can be applied for any circumstance, not just specifically for this little one, and it somehow disappears for anything else. No, it's quite general. It doesn't matter what I've done in the field, two things are going to happen. The pressure changes and the saturation changes. Okay, so this recovery factor accounts for the expansion of the oil in this particular case, because I'm looking at oil, so that's a mess, messy way of uh, indicating it, but I'm trying to indicate that term. See that? That's good, excellent. Okay, so it's it's this term. It's the expansion of the oil, and this is due to the displacement. So 
so clearly there are two things you want to do. One of the two things you want to do, you want to make the recovery factor as close to one. So you want that term of the minus to be small. So two things, you want SO to be close to zero. So you want to push out the oil, right? Use water to do it, but water and oil don't mix. So you trap, um, you trap the oil. Gas does a lot better. It can drive the saturation down, surfactants, low salinity. You, you, you might, you, it doesn't matter, right? Anything to reduce that SO, that's good. The second thing is you want this expansion factor to be um, obviously as small as possible, which means you want BO to be as big as possible. Where's BO as big as possible? At the bubble point. So what you're doing is if you drop the pressure to the bubble point, you've allowed the oil to expand. Anything below the bubble point, the oil's actually shrinking, which is bad news. So um, what you want to do, right? Easy thing in reservoir engineering, you want to design a process so that SO is as small as possible, so you push the oil out, and uh, BO is as close to the bubble point. Don't go below it. But in this case, we have, okay, so um, what's our recovery factor? So now we're going to do the specific case. So for a solution gas drive, so I know I'm going to get rid of this because but this equation, um, hold on a second, let me do this. So in this case, my SO is, well, it's one minus SWI, that's what I started with, minus the critical gas saturation. So what we have is the water really hasn't done anything, the expansion of water is not irrelevant, so we've got SWI is our initial water saturation, is more or less stuck. We've now got this gas saturation, but all the saturations have to add up to one, so the oil saturation is one minus that. So my recovery factor right, is one minus BOI. One minus SWI. And then SOI is one minus SWI. Okay, so let's, um, let's talk of some uh, you know, typical values. Okay. Um, so let's do some typical values just so that we can get an example. So BOI over BO, if we drop below the bubble point, that's actually going to be less, there's going to be um, greater than one, sorry, because if we look at this pressure, BO, it goes up and then down. So we're here and here, that's BOI, that's BO. So BOI is bigger than BO. So imagine that's say 1.2, just as an example. Okay, SGC is the critical gas saturation. That's normally about 20%, something like that. SWI may be say 30% in this example, 0.3, okay. So the recovery factor is one minus 1 1.2 times this is 0.5 over 0 0.7, something like that. Um, so that's equal to 1 minus um, 0.6 over 0.7, so it's 6 uh, sevenths. Uh, what 6 sevenths is 8. That's something of the order if we do 600 divided by 7. 6, that's 4, 40, that's 85, something like that, 85, 86. So that's about 15%, or something. right? We're looking at something about 15%. Okay, so that's not, that's not very good, okay? And the reason is it's all driven by this critical gas saturation, okay? So it's basically, you know, whatever this critical gas saturation is related to the recovery factor, it's less than that because the, the oil's actually shrinking. So we're normally typically a solution gas drive, we're getting recovery factors in the range of about 10, 15, 20, 25%. Okay, then it's over. So it's not, it's not exactly ideal. So that was solution gas drive. Okay, so that's, um, that actually completes that. So we can know what happens above the bubble point, all right, the fluids just expand linearly. Um, and that typically, if there's no aquifer drive, will give you, um, you know, less than a year of production before you start having to inject uh, another phase, normally water. Okay. If we drop below the bubble point, which you can, um, you get to this critical gas saturation, but again, that's pretty bad uh, news. Okay. So now let's um, look at a, a, a water drive. Okay. Maybe we can put that here. Oops, I don't want to do that. 
Okay, a water drive. So imagine there is a water drive. So now we have F equals N E naught. And again, we'll assume that we started well above the bubble point, so the M term is zero, okay? And we're also going to assume that the rock, although it will play a role, is a small effect because now we've got a significant. Okay, so that's my equation. And what we do is we make it an equation of a straight line. And so once you know this approach, it's really straightforward. It's not some magic to do this. WC, just as we'd have in the gas field, is our unknown. And so the plot that you would do is F over E naught on the Y axis, delta P over E naught on the X axis. You notice that these are equation of a straight line that is positive. So the intercept is N and the slope is WC. So for those of you who followed the uh, video on gas material balance with a water drive, look, it's the same, isn't it? Right? You're basically doing the same thing. You've got F over E naught is N plus WC delta P over E naught. And by the way, this works even if we're below the bubble point. So sometimes you can have an aquifer the aquifer is reasonably strong, so the water's moving in, but the pressure's still declining and declining and declining and declining and declining. And sometimes you can go below the bubble point, which obviously is not good news, but there's nothing in these equations that, that means that's impossible. Okay? And then the strength of the aquifer up here is the relative size of this term and this term. So often you may have 50% aquifer, 50% oil, which means instead of being able to, instead of uh, having to inject water after about nine or 10 months, you may be getting to 18, 20 months. You may even get to two years. But that's not forever, is it? Okay. So unless you have an aquifer drive that's contributing, say, 80 or 90%, then you may be able to extend the field life before you reach the bubble point. Um, you know, something uh, of more, more of the order of a decade. Okay. Then you're looking good because then you can be producing above the bubble point for about 10 years. And then at the end of 10 years, you might have um, actually flooded most of the reservoir. And, you know, you may want to drop the pressure a bit, go below the bubble point to see if you can uh, get um, some additional oil. But actually, you may not need to inject water at all. But it depends on the strength of this aquifer. And the material balance equation is the best way of doing it. Okay, so that's... Um, that I've left up this recovery factor because, of course, as I've said, you may want to know, well, when would the water drive actually fill the reservoir? And of course, that's exactly the same analysis as we've already done um, for a gas field, isn't it? So here, you want a water influx that will fill your field, which is, as we know, V phi net to gross, okay? And then the change in saturation is you start at SOI and you end up when the water displaces oil, not at some critical, but at your residual oil saturation. And again, the residual oil saturation is a complex beast that is measured in the lab. And it is, it's quite complex because in this case, because oil has been sitting in the pore space of the rock and can actually make the rock sort of oily, um, the residual saturation is not necessarily the oil trapped in the big pores. Um, the oil can actually be um, confined to layers. It can be quite a complex, a complex, well, one say a complex beast. Okay? Um, so it's something that's measured in the laboratory. And then we know that this is WC delta P. And we also know that uh, V phi net to gross SOI divided by VOI is equal to N. So I don't want to go through the equations in great detail. You can calculate the pressure drop needed to. Um, fill the entire field and you could compare that with the pressure drop needed to get to the bubble point. And if that's smaller, you know that actually the water drive will fill the entire field before you reach the bubble point. You don't need to inject water at all. So it's a very simple calculation um, that gives you that idea. But I do want to talk about recovery factor because we know exactly what the recovery factor will be. It's one minus BOI over BO. 
if you're near the bubble point, that um, should be a value less than one, okay, but certainly close to one, and then that's just SOR. So, okay. so um, it's not quite as complex a calculation as it is when you do a gas field material balance, because BO, you should be operating around the bubble point, um, so the BO value, knowing exactly the pressure drop is it's so important. The key thing is, is delta P, right? Is the delta P greater or less than, right? PI minus P bubble. Because if delta P is greater than the pressure drop to reach the bubble point, you're going to drop below the bubble point at some time in the field life, and you should consider injecting water. If it's actually less, you're gonna fill the reservoir, the water comes in from the bottom of the field, Okay, the water comes in from the bottom, that's fantastic, fills the entire field with water quite stably. Okay, you live beh leave behind your residual, but there's not a lot you can do, do for that. Um, and you don't have to inject water, so that saves a lot of money. Okay, well that's, um, that was an aquifer drive. Let's um, do the final case, okay, which uh, I'm not gonna consider a compaction drive. You can have some rocks, uh, poorly consolidated rocks, sands, for instance, where actually the compressibility of the rock is so high that actually it's the compression of the rock itself is a significant fraction of recovery. But we sort of um, cover that when we when we went down when we looked um, at recovery above the bubble point. So it's not it's not anything new, and it should you know hopefully you get the idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the last case, which maybe I'll do in green. That is where WC, let's say we're going to ignore the aquifer, but we do have a finite M. Okay, so what might indicate that you've got a gas cap? Okay, you can sort of put it in the equation and see what happens. No, no, but there are there's some reasons. Um, one, directly from a seismic survey, um, you can actually see a sort of bright spot often where there's gas because it's much lower density, very different sound wave velocities than there are um, in rock saturated with uh, water or oil. Okay, so that's reason one. Two, you might drill through a gas cap, so you've seen it, um, you know, you produce gas, um, you can see it in the logs. The third one is actually that the initial pressure, as we just said, is close to the bubble point. And in fact, it's that third one that's quite interesting. So often, you don't really see anything on seismic, you haven't actually drilled through the gas cap, but the initial pressure in the oil is suspiciously close to the bubble point. So it could be in equilibrium with gas. It doesn't have to be, you don't know for sure. Okay, so um, we're going to assume that there's no aquifer drive because otherwise uh, you know, the equations get more complex, but uh, the equation becomes F equals N E naught, we always have to have that term, plus N M and G, okay? And we make it an equation of a straight line. At this point, hopefully everyone can see where we're heading here. This is hardly you know, sophisticated mathematics. So we've got our table of values. Always make sure you've got zeros here, otherwise you are going to kill yourself. Okay, so again, you have a positive slope. Here are your points. You find your best fit straight line. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, there you are. Your intercept is N and your slope is NM. So if it turns out that there is no gas cap, well, there's uh, these points are horizontal. Okay, that's your N value. If there is any deviation from uh, a horizontal line, Right, that means that there's indication that there is a gas cap, your actual value of N is lower, you're actually supporting production from the gas cap, okay, so you've got both, um, and the slope there is N. Okay. And uh, what you'd normally do uh, with, with this type of analysis is again, you want to look at the relative size of this term and this term, right? What's providing the recovery? If it's mainly just the gas and solution gas, because remember you're below the bubble point, that's not good, 
Okay, so you need to boost the gas cap drive. You have to inject any produced gas into the gas cap. You might want to consider water injection as well from the base of the ore column, not from the aquifer, because we've assumed there is no aquifer, so there isn't an aquifer to inject into. Okay, um, the other options would be to, uh, to look at whether or not you want to produce the gas. Is there a market for the gas? If you've got a very strong gas cap drive, that's actually good news because then the gas will drive out the oil and can actually be a very efficient process. You can, because the residual saturation left behind from a gas flood is potentially uh, as, as low as just a few percent, you can actually get uh, recovery factors that are as high as 70% from a, from a strong uh, gas cap drive. So uh, this can be a very favorable production mechanism depending on uh, Okay, I'm uh, actually going to stop there. Uh, the reason is because it's a bit theoretical. I've shown the equations, I give you some idea. In the end, you know, material balance is actually quite a sort of practical subject. You need to look at some data, you need to do the plots, and you need to think about what it means. And there isn't, there isn't a magic bullet. There isn't, you get this answer, you do this, you make a lot of money or you produce more oil. It's more about understanding what's going on. A good reservoir engineer understands, you know, it's a gas cap drive or 70% gas cap drive, 30% comes from the expansion of the oil and the solution gas. I am going to manage the field so that I boost the gas cap drive by re-injecting produced gas. You know, just thinking about the various processes and what's um, going on. So that, is really all I want to say, sort of want to say from the theoretical perspective. Okay? One of the big things that's missing from material balance is there's no time dependence. Right? I sort of said, well, you can tell because you want to recover so much per year, but there's no explicit time dependence in material balance. And so it assumes that you have a reservoir with sort of uniform properties and the pressure is uniform as well. Okay? So that's that is a bit of an approximation, particularly for large complex fields, and I don't want to sort of dwell on that. So material balance in general is used to look at relatively mature fields, relatively small fields, look at the gas fields as well. But when we get to more complex situations, people do want to look at time dependence, they want to look at fluid flow. So the next video will be introducing time dependence, again, in a very empirical fashion, um, before we actually tackle fluid flow more rigorously by equations. So I'll finish there. Um, thank you. For